My career has been built on winning. I'm unbelievably passionate about netball. I showed the power of the black singlet and the silver fern. I'm a firm believer that if you dream high, you can achieve high. A fantastic playing for the Kiwis and got the opportunity to actually lead the haka. More than anything else, I love the players that I coach. You're on cloud nine when you're out there and it's really enjoyable winning. I only had one ambition in my life and that was to be an all black. We call this series The Chosen Ones. I want to thank you very much for talking to us. It's been a great honour. All right, Sir Edmund, please do the honours. The winner of the Coach of the Year is Tab Baldwin. Sir Edmund, uh, it's just magnificent that you're here. Uh, you have been an inspiration to our basketball team. You will always be an inspiration to this nation and we will never be able to repay you for the, everything that you've done for us. <laughs> to the team, we've got five of the great guys out there. I mean, you inspired this country with what you did. You inspire me every day with what you do. And everything that I do is only a reflection of the quality of the people that you are. So thank you, guys. You're, you're unbelievable. <laughs> Lastly, I just want to say uh, that this award is not mine. It is the coaching staff of the Tall Blacks. Uh, Ninid Vucinich and Murray McMahon, uh, we coached the Tall Blacks. This is our award, I guess, and we have this incredible New Zealand public who got in behind us like we couldn't really understand and fathom, and we have you to thank for inspiring us every step of the way. Thank you very, very much. I had an idyllic childhood. I had parents that cared for every need that I had, that loved me tremendously, mm -hmm. um, disciplined me, you know, made me understand right from wrong, gave me a, a wonderful academic uh, understanding and, and respect for you know, schools. And a great world that I grew up in, Jacksonville Beach, Florida, was a, a small Florida beach community, which you know, the, those don't exist anymore. They've all grown up and are very commercial now. I had four older brothers that um, yeah. made me a man, uh, very young, because they were real tough on me, but at the same time uh, took care of me and made sure that uh, nobody else got to me. And I had an older sister just to kind of balance things out a bit, you know, who uh, loved me and took care of me as well. Were you a competitive family sporting-wise in those days? Was basketball your thing when you were, when you were that small? Everything was our thing yeah. in terms of competition. It, it didn't matter, you know. When you come from a family with you know, so many boys and, and sports being sort of the focal point through my dad as a coach, uh, you know, we, were, we were all about competing in a game of Monopoly or Scrabble or if it you know, went outside, you know, who could throw a ball the farthest or the hardest or you know, who could punch the hardest. And you know, being the young kid, I, you know, I lost a lot <laughs> and I was constantly being taught lessons. But I think what it did is it created a, healthy or not, it created an unbelievable resolve in me to find ways to be successful against the odds because it just couldn't beat my brothers. You know, they were bigger and older and stronger and, and more experienced, and, uh, but they taught me how to persist. Strong religious upbringing in that re respect? Very strong, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, dad and mom would go to, to mass daily, um, not just on Sundays. and. Uh, there were times, particularly when I was in high school, where my dad used to say to me, if he felt I was straying a little bit in terms of my behavior, he'd say, uh, son, I want you in mass every morning before school. And so well, I would want to be down in the gym practicing, and you know, he would drag me away from that, and, and uh, I'd be in morning mass in the, the school chapel, and you know, it wasn't exactly the place I wanted to be. But you know, again, all those things make an impression on you. You were Thomas Anthony Baldwin at birth, right? When did Tad kick in? I think right away, yeah. you know, after f four brothers, uh, maybe the parents were running out of names, I don't know, but Thomas and Anthony, good saints' names in the, the Catholic Church, and 
Thomas Anthony Baldwin became Tab, and I don't really know why, and, and it's stuck, and, and that's what everybody refers to me as. Your dad's John A. Baldwin. He was never Jab. You wouldn't have had the, the nerve? No, no. He was John A. or Johnny B., uh, and that was only said when he was well out of hearing range uh, because you, didn't, you just didn't tamper with that man. Uh, he, could, he could bring down the wrath on you pretty quickly and, and pretty tough. He was obviously, though, through all that, a, a great inspiration to you and, and what you did through those early years. Yeah, I mean, he's a dominant force. Uh, you know, there's no question that in our household, Mom provided the love and, and the affection, and she was a, she was a saint. Mm. She really was a saint. Uh, Dad provided the direction and the discipline. And, um, you know, later, I don't think I ever really, and I don't think any of the brothers ever really achieved the status of being Dad's friend. Uh, but certainly the relationship normalized as we became adults and, mm. and uh, you know, he treated us as adults when we were well into our 30s. But until then, it was, he was very dictatorial and, and very directional and, and that's the way he had been raised and that's what he believed his responsibility was, was to direct us in life to a position where we would have opportunities to be successful and, and you know, that's what guided how he treated us. Did he say, Tab, look, basketball, not hockey, not, not baseball, not uh, you know, some of those other traditional American sports. Your basketball, that, that's your channel. Did he ever say that to you mm, early on? Not at all, mm. no. He said uh, academics. Yeah. And a matter of fact, you know, he said, when I finished high school basketball, he said, no more basketball. He said, you're through. You're not good enough to go on and make a living out of this, so direct your energies and direct your thoughts into something that's going to benefit you in the future. And, and you know, he opposed me being a coach. So I went to uh, University of Notre Dame for an academic degree and, and got into business for a couple of years as an accountant and uh, just didn't enjoy that. It wasn't my cup of tea and I wanted to get into coaching. Uh, I wanted to follow in dad's footsteps and you know, he discouraged that and tried to frustrate it. Uh, but eventually, you know, I think at the age of about 25, uh, I started coaching basketball as an assistant coach mm -hmm. at, a, at a small university level. We don't, I think, in this country, don't quite understand the significance of college sport. I mean, it's big, isn't it? It's, it's seriously big business, college sport. It's bigger than anything we have here, financially, uh, marketing-wise, profile-wise. Uh, it's bigger than anything in the U.S. except the Super Bowl. But I think probably the thing that made the biggest impression on me in coaching college basketball, and the reason I don't believe I would ever go back to it, is that you have to recruit. And when you're recruiting, you're basically out there selling your university and selling your basketball program to some fairly spoiled 17-year-old kids who think the world revolves around them. And it's really a pretty nasty business in the U.S., the recruitment of, of high school athletes into the collegiate system. And I think it propagates a lot of the problems that if you follow basketball, you now see in the U.S. national team when they go to these world championships and Olympics and can't win medals because these players don't understand how to sacrifice themselves for a team. They've, they've been coddled and spoiled and promised everything and they've been told they're the main man for too long and, and, uh, and these problems are manifesting themselves and thankfully we don't have these problems in, in New Zealand sport. How far do you think you would have got if you'd have stayed in the American system? It's a really difficult question you know, to answer because... But it must have been one you must have weighed up at the time because that's the environment you knew and that's the environment you were probably looking to initially when you set out. Absolutely, and, and I didn't turn my back on that environment because I thought, oh, this is going to be easier in New Zealand. I literally stayed in New Zealand because I love the country. It wasn't basketball that kept me here. Uh, I was really making a lifestyle decision in 1988-89. But had I stayed in the U.S. system, you, you need to get a break over there. You need to get aligned with a coach who can kind of drag you up the chain and you be an assistant coach to somebody who has a lot of success and then on the back of that maybe somebody will offer you a job and it's usually a, a lower level university and you go into that university and you have some success and then somebody says oh okay this guy can coach a little bit we'll pick him up at another level and if you're very fortunate and, and you have some continued success you know then you can get to an elite program and from there well, if you're successful, then you, you've made it, and you're extremely wealthy, and, and you're extremely famous, and all the doors open to you. You can't get much further from Jacksonville 
Beach, Florida, or in Alabama, and these places than Dunedin. What did you think when you first hit Dunedin? You know, I came from flat, hot Florida, and I moved to this city that was green and hilly and ocean everywhere and a beautiful harbor, and, and the people were wonderful. And, and, you know, I just fell in love with the place mm -hmm. right away. Um, I didn't particularly like the weather uh, when I went through the winter, but it was all part of the experience for me. Mm -hmm. And and coaching basketball, I was happy because I was a head coach. I was no longer an assistant coach, so I was getting to make decisions and do things my own way. And I think more than anything else, I just I love the players that I coached because they were good guys. Mm -hmm. There was you know the egos just weren't present. They weren't you know prevalent. I walked into practice and I had eager players who wanted to, to learn something and bust their butt and try to become a good basketball team. And that's a great environment for a coach. Under new American coach Tab Baldwin, the home team was desperate for a win first up. Wainui Amata led 26-20 at the break, a score which reflected the lack of offensive skills from both sides. What did that teach you about your, your coaching techniques? What, what did you learn from that, those early days? Oh, I made so many mistakes. I was coaching a group of guys that did a lot more with effort than with tactics or strategies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were fighters, and I was using the American college playing systems with these guys. And, and you know, we had some success tactically, and, and they, could, they could learn a bit, but it wasn't easy for them, you know, because I was very structured, and, and they hadn't had a lot of that kind of coaching uh, in their careers. And when we did get into first division in 1990, I think everything really fell apart. You know, I had probably substandard talent compared to other first division teams. I wasn't an experienced coach. I made a lot of mistakes. I, I had the biggest ego in the Otago basketball team, and I was the one that said, well, I'll devise a whole new playing system for these guys, and it was atrocious. Dunedin fans have always been a boisterous lot in the stadium, and with this being Otago's home debut in first division, it'll be mighty rowdy under the stadium roof. The home crowd will be just the fillip needed to lift the Nuggets after two big losses up north. Losses that have made the team even more determined to put on a good performance in front of the home crowd. We're a basketball team that uh, kind of got into something that uh, we weren't sure exactly what it was. It was kind of like walking through the bushes and running into a hornet's nest. Uh, but, you know, I think we will recover and I think we'll be a good basketball team by year's end. Just how important is this first home game to you? It's very important. You know, they're all important, but uh, we see it as a real opportunity to get a first win. The Tiger was 14 points down at the half and heading for its third big loss in as many games. I learned by failing, and, and we failed miserably that first year in first division, and I was given my walking papers, and, you know, I had to go away and think about my career. I had to think about coaching. I had to think about my approach to it. I had to think about staying in New Zealand. And uh, on the back of all of these things and some time down in Invercargill, which is a great place to go and think, believe me, um, I came out of it a much better person and a much better basketball coach. So far removed from that is uh, back here in Auckland, the Auckland Stars. It seems so far removed. How, how did you get involved with the Stars? I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate because I was down in Invercargill after my Otago failure and I was... Um, running a YMCA fitness center down there and I was so fortunate to be surrounded by just wonderful people who more than anything helped me rebuild my self-esteem, my self-confidence and, and allowed me the opportunity that when coaching came along again to do it with some sense of self. Because when I was fired in Otago, I lost that. I, I lost that and, and I didn't handle that well. So that healing process down in Invercargill was very important for me, and it, it took sort of a year and a half. And then out of the blue, Curtis Wooten, who was coaching the Auckland basketball team, and uh, a friend you know, who I had known through basketball for a few years, rang me and said, you know, why don't you get back into it? Why don't you come up to Auckland and be my assistant coach? Virtually at the same time, Bob Bishop, who was the coach of the national team, the Tall Blacks, called me and said, why don't you coach the New Zealand juniors? Mm -hmm. One thing led to another, and a couple of years later, the, the guys that were running the Auckland franchise wanted me to, to be the head coach. And, um, you know, so that started my era with uh, Auckland basketball, which was really, a, you know, a wonderful, wonderful time and a wonderful highlight for me. Basketball-wise, at that time, what, what's a typical 
club week involved or a typical franchise week? Are, you know, how many practices a week? Are we, how many hours are we dedicated to actually the sport? I think from a player standpoint, you, you know, you're talking about um, three to four training sessions of, a, of the duration of a couple of hours each. Uh, then your, your game preparation on the day, which may be you know, an hour in the morning where you kind of walk through your preparation for the game and then the game itself. So not overly significant. Um, it's part-time as opposed to full-time. Mm. And because it's part-time, the players obviously, they get part-time wages for that. And so they will use the rest of their time to go out and, and drum up other work, uh, you know, and, and other employment to, to fill their time and to fill their pockets. So it's difficult to make them fully professional in New Zealand. So what about a coach who's got a an American university degree, and uh, I guess he's frustrated that he can't have more time with them. What, what the hell did you do? I used to sit in the office, and, and uh, I would develop these, these incredibly intricate statistical packages on the entire NBL and every player, and I would profile every player in the country, and I would look at hours and hours of video, and I would prepare myself. And I would uh, just try and be as authoritative as I possibly could. But also, you know, when, when I worked with Auckland Basketball, you, you know, you're put into all the other facets of the organization. You have to get out there and deal with sponsors and get out there and sell and market and, and do all the media and, you know, all the other aspects of, of what goes into managing and operating a, a sporting franchise, a small sporting franchise. So I was very busy mm -hmm. uh, and I enjoyed it and I learned an awful lot. I mean, it, it really fleshed me out as a as a person in terms of my skills. I wasn't just a coach. And so, you know, you carry that into other aspects of your life. You're actually harping back to the point you made about uh, selling a university uh, when you were back in the coaching role back there. You're actually doing the same sort of thing to a large extent, trying to sell your franchise. But even in a place like Auckland, you're, you're a hell of a long way down the pecking order sports-wise. How frustrating was that? At times it's frustrating, you know, but I, I think I've always been a person who philosophically has always said to people, don't tell me why you can't do something, tell me why you can do it. And if I was going to apply that philosophy to myself, then I was going to have to get out there in the community and make things happen. And so with, you know, with these two guys that own this team who taught me an awful lot, we were pretty aggressive. And, and you know, I can tell you a story about after we'd won a championship, we didn't believe we were getting enough media in the Auckland media, which is, again, difficult to break into because so many things happening. So we set up a, a meeting with the editor of the New Zealand Herald and we walked in his office with the trophy from the previous year's championship, put it on the table and sat down and said, you know, what are you going to do to make sure that that trophy stays in Auckland next year as an Auckland newspaper? How are you going to help us and what can we do for you to make sure that we get column inches? And, and this is an example of how we were aggressive and, and how our mindset wasn't, well, we're winners, so we're going to sit back and let it all come to us. You know, we couldn't operate in that marketplace in that way. We had to aggressively go out there and create opportunities for ourselves. What did he do, the editor? Well, we, we managed to you know, get a situation where we built a relationship. They dedicated a writer then to the basketball scene in Auckland, and, and consequently there were more column inches. And we held up our end of the bargain by going out and winning the mm -hmm. championship the next year. And so our, our media presence and our media relationships continued to grow through that period of the late 90s. And, and um, I think the Auckland Stars carved out a significant part of the media market in Auckland. And, and uh, it, it was due to those, the efforts of, of yeah. uh, the guys that owned the team. Well, you had a hell of a record. I mean, you know, I mean, phenomenal record. Probably one of the most successful records of uh, any sporting team of any code in the country. Yeah, it was a great run. You know, and it, it, was, it was centered around very good players, a, a tremendous team chemistry, a well-run organization, and, uh, you know, a, a system that we all believed in, and, and we grew that system over years. And, and it, there was, it was so much fun to coach these guys because they could absorb. They, they were an intelligent team. They could absorb all the things that I want to do, and it allowed me as a coach to grow myself, too, because I could experiment. I could bring new systems in and... I mean, from a technical standpoint, you know, we, we introduced the amoeba defense to, to the NBL. We introduced the triangle offense to the NBL. Um, and these are playing systems which were being used in other places of the world, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But because we had talent in this Auckland team and we had intelligence, 
we were able to introduce these systems, and these are the same systems that, you know, to a modified degree, went on to, to use with the tall blacks. I wonder if Busninic really wanted to foul Hanari. Hanari being a very, very good percentage shooter from the free throw line. He had a sort of an aura about him, I guess, ever since I met him. Every time Tab talks about the, the whole team concept, he lives and dies by it. He, he really does totally believe in, in team basketball and how it's supposed to be played. Especially in New Zealand, you know, we've got a, a, a group of guys that do a lot of things good or well. And, and it's his ability to be able to bring the best out of all of us in the team environment that's, uh, that's what's given us our success. What we had started to build was a mindset that we can be giant killers, that we can do something better than anybody had ever done before in New Zealand basketball, that we could reach heights that other teams probably hadn't even aspired to. You know, I like challenges, and um, the NBL was always a challenge, but after six years we had won, won five championships. It didn't hold the kind of challenge that it had had in the early days of coaching Auckland. You know, is it was sort of a mountain that I had conquered. I loved the view, and I wanted to hang out there, and I wanted to you know, keep climbing that mountain every chance that I got, but it was climbable. You know, I'd been there and I'd done that, and I was looking around. New Zealand basketball enters a new era tonight. Auckland coach Tab Baldwin has been confirmed as the new Tall Blacks coach. Baldwin takes the top job from Keith Meir, who held a monopoly on the position for 13 years. Nikki Gosney reports. Tad Baldwin doing what he does best, coaching young Kiwi basketballers. And now after more than a decade of dedication, the Kiwi-based American has landed the job he's always wanted. You know, it's a dream come true for me. I've had ambitions to coach the national team for probably six or seven years. And I've worked extremely hard toward that end. I feel very comfortable with the fact that I'm pretty much a New Zealander now. I may not sound like it, but having been here as long as I have, uh, my commitment to the team is, is beyond question. The only question now is whether he can achieve what every tall black coach aspires to, qualifying for the world championships, and that means taking down the Aussies. When I got down here and saw the vehemence with which New Zealanders, I won't say hated Australians because you, we don't hate Australians. We hate to lose to Australians. Mm -hmm. But the vehemence with, with which we wanted to compete and beat Australians, when, when I saw that, well, at first I was stunned by it. And, and it was a rivalry that probably exceeded anything that I even saw in the States, like a Celtics-Lakers rivalry or, or a, a Packers-Cowboys rivalry. It exceeded even that. And then, of course, it wasn't very long before I was caught up in it. And beating Australia is really important. And the New Zealander, they're exerting a bit of dominance over the Australians early in game one. That's all they need. They need to just that bold of confidence saying that they think they can do it. And trust me, we can get away with the win. Here's the speed of Dickel. The Australians need to adjust. Pero again. Oh, yeah. Don't let the big boy fill it. That's money back to KC. I'm telling you, Pero Carroll's a strong shooter. Listen to the crowd. Two-man game with Perro Jones. Yeah. He's the Superman in this league, baby. I'm telling you, he's done everything. That's Phil Jones. Phil Jones has done everything but sell popcorn at the front door. Look Take at this. Take a shot, Showtime. He sits back. He puts it on the floor between two defenders off the sweet glass that it is and into the basket. Phil Jones is a hero at the moment. I think Tab coming into the team has lifted us to that next level. He's the kind of person that comes to a team and says to you that you can win. Like a hammer hitting against the wall, against, you know, into you all the time. He's saying, you can win, you can win. You know, just concentrate on the possession at the time. And if you win that possession and you win another possession, you know, if you keep doing that, you can win games. And, and that's his philosophy, you know. And it, it works. You know, he, and he's got us believing in ourselves. Um, and once you win a few games, you start feeling confident and you believe that you can compete against anybody. He's our Superman tonight, I tell you. The three-point play! Look at the crowd! They're going berserk! Listen to these guys! Still need to maintain composure. Two quick shots from Australia can change things very, very easily. It's not enough, I tell you, it's not enough. There's no fuel in the gas tank anymore. 
How did you beat them? How, how did you come up with a, a plan really in such a short space of time that did what basically no one else could do? You know, again, circumstances always play a role in these things. You know, you, people shouldn't look at these things and, and try and draw conclusions from them unless they really look at the scenario around it and everything else. The Australian basketball was going through a transition period themselves. Mm -hmm. They had had the great, great era of Andrew Gaze and Luke Longley and Mark Bradkey and Andrew Vlahov and Shane Heal, this tremendous group of players who were all fading into retirement at this point in time. And as, as with so many very, very dominant sporting teams, they tend to suppress the next generation. It's, it's not like you just go from one great group to the next great group. It doesn't happen very often. And so Australian basketball was a bit down. We had this crew of players coming through, you know, led by Piero Cameron and Phil Jones and Mark Dickel and Sean Marks, who were promising some fantastic things. And these two forces collided. And we still had to overcome the psychology of beating Australia in basketball. And even though there's no question we were a better team, we still had to overcome that. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess how we did it, you know, in that scenario was we had a good game plan. We had a, a confident team. We had just been to the Goodwill Games and we had had wins over Cuba and over Brazil and over Canada. So, you know, there was some sense that, that we could achieve. And when we got that first game under our belts, and I think in the first game we started off something like 23 to 4 ahead of Australia, well, that was all we needed. You know, we were away to the races and, and we knew we could beat this team. It wasn't easy. They came back as Australian teams do. They came back really hard at us. They made it difficult. But winning that game and then, then winning that series was, was the first step. Words cannot describe what people in this gym are feeling right now. Nina Bucci's just said, we're there. We're there. Chad Baldwin knows it. He has us believing that we can beat any team on any, in any given day. You know, we know anything's possible, and if we can play the way we know we can, um, then there's no reason why we can't have success. Um, call us dreamers, call us, you know, over-believers, but, you know, we have a lot of self-belief in this team, and that stems from him, and he has a lot of belief in us as individuals and as players on the court as well. Let's get good results, offense and defense. Let's go. Pick it up, attack the basket. Pick it up now, pick it up. Keep the defense, keep the defense moving. Touch sidelines, get out there, get out, run, run. Let's go, D, come on, defense. Keep your lines back, fellas, keep your lines back. Let's go, let's go. Talk, talk, talk. I want them hit, all right? I don't care if it's your teammate and your best friend, I want them hit, and hit hard. There's a lot of times in a game when we believe that big men and our opposition are always gonna tend to play closer to the basket whenever they can. And that means if our big men have the ability to shoot the ball out here, if we can create a shot for them, then maybe we can hit a critical basket at a critical stage in the game. Yeah. And Piero Cameron's a guy that we've used this tactic with many times because he's such an excellent perimeter shooter. So if I, if I have a minute, I'll pull the guys in the huddle and I'll say, okay, okay this is the play we're gonna run. Piero, we're gonna put you here with the ball and we'll call you the five man. Okay, and we'll put our one man 
here in the post. We'll put our shooting guard, and this is a player that'll be a decoy in this situation, down here in the corner. We'll put our other big man over here on the weak side, and then with my small forward up here at the top. So we'll set up this sort of scenario, which looks like our basic offense. And then we'll run a play where we, we pass the ball up here to the point. We get Piro with his defender on him, and the X will be his defender to go down here and set a screen for our decoy player. Now what happens typically, because this guy is a big man and he wants to go close to the basket, he, and we can predict this by watching video, he'll just slip into this area right here defensively and kind of protect the basket because the ball is here. Mm -hmm. We'll flash this man up, which is our normal offense. And now from this scenario, we just draw a second diagram, okay? And we, we have the ball here. We'll pass it to our other big man here. Mm -hmm. Here we have Piro setting a screen for our decoy cutter who will be coming right here. And then this is the key. We'll call this guy X5 because he's guarding Piro. Our point guard, usually Mark Dickel or Paul Hanari, will simply turn around and seal that man in the lane. Mm -hmm. Piro will pop back to the three-point arc this player will dribble across, fake this handoff to this man, which draws all the defense to right here. Pass the ball out here to Piro, and there's the three-point shot. And this is a play that we've used many times over the years, and only a couple of factors need to be executed as critical in this factor. One, he's got to be able to shoot. Mm. Two, you've got to have this big man defensively who's a little bit lazy and is going to naturally go to this spot on the floor. And the most important part is if you're going to use this in critical situations in a game, you've got to have a guy who wants the ball in the big moment in a basketball game. And Piro Cameron is typical of that kind of player. What an exciting time this is for New Zealand basketball. The Tall Blacks have had a tough build-up during which coach Tab Baldwin has worked hard on belief and on confidence. And any team Tab puts on the court is going to be playing to win. You know, when, when I took over the Tall Black job, I didn't envisage coaching at a world championship. I mean, New Zealand had never been there. Mm. I didn't, they had been to an Olympics, but it was an invitation. Um, you know, when Australia was the host of the Sydney Olympics in 2000. So, it wasn't like I went in there saying, how quickly can I get back to an Olympics or how can we achieve getting to a world championships? It was more about the experience of coaching a national team and being in international basketball. And then all of a sudden, we have this opportunity to go to Indianapolis. And, you know, we're going to Indiana. The University of Notre Dame is in Indiana. My father went to the University mm -hmm. of Notre Dame. You know, Indiana is the hotbed of American basketball traditionally. And yeah, I was overwhelmed just by the opportunity. You finished fourth. I mean, you finished fourth in that championship, which gave you a, a world ranking, God's sake, in, in such a short space of time. I, I mean, you talk about circumstances, but I mean, it's an amazing set of circumstances which takes you from the bottom of the heap to fourth in the world very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah. You know, I mean, so fast that you don't even have time to, to take on board what the ramifications are going to be. Um, you know, the, the news we got back from New Zealand as we're going through this tournament, that everybody in the country is watching it, and the emails that are starting to pour through to us, and, you know, people are, are you know, taking note of something that you're intricately in, involved in that you just didn't dream that this would happen. And, and literally, we didn't dream it. And, Fortunately, we had the distraction of actually having to play these games. Mm. And uh, one day after another, too. You know, we played nine games in 11 days. So there wasn't a lot of time to sit back and reflect on the magnitude of what was happening. And I guess, you know, even still, it, it bothers me a little bit to hear you say and to hear so many people say, fourth, you know, what a phenomenal accomplishment. We won it first. Mm. We were there. Particularly once this thing started to roll, we were there to get first. And fourth was a disappointment for us. Tab, but can I suggest to you then that it, it, it doesn't always work that way with New Zealand sporting teams, particularly minority sports, that, that you, you set your sights that high. I mean, you beat sides like Russia, Venezuela, China, Puerto Rico, you know, uh, very, very good basketball sides with 
pretty proud traditions. Normally, um, for a lot of New Zealand sporting folk, any one of those wins would be enough. What, what drove you harder? Probably the people that you're talking about. Mm. I don't think there was anything about the world champs that drove us harder, anything about the fact that we had beaten Australia to get there. There were no external motivations, I think, that created um, this, this desire within our team to be the best. I think that's who we were. I think that's what the individuals were made of. You know, um, all we saw was an opportunity. We saw, you know, we were island hopping, if you will, and we were on our way to a destination that we didn't get to. And we weren't thinking, well, we've conquered this island, so let's sit here and enjoy it. It, it, it was all happening too fast. And uh, the snowball was getting big, and, and we were enjoying that ride. And, and it was feeding itself. You know, we were starting to look, sit there and say, gosh, we're in a quarterfinal. If we win a quarterfinal, we're in a semi. And if we can win a semi, then we're playing in a gold medal game. And is there any reason that we should think that these games aren't winnable? No, there's no reason that we should think that. Forget the fact that we might be world champion and nobody can conceive of that. Let's just look at this game. Is it winnable? Yeah, it's winnable. So where does it take us? And that's how we looked at it. How did you deal with the players then on a day-to-day -day basis? How did you keep them at the same level you were thinking of? Because I can't believe for one second that uh, the, the basic New Zealand sportsman uh, immediately thinks that way. How, how did you get in their heads to get, keep them hungry, to keep them believing? Russia was a game that we had talked an awful lot about leading up to the championships. And, and you know, that was the psychological ploy that I was using. Because I, I figured if we could beat Russia, then, then we could be on our way to something special. Mm. Who? I mean, what? I don't know, but something special. Nobody expected us to beat Russia. And I mean nobody. So when we started talking about this in the months leading up to this campaign, we started saying, we can beat Russia and we'll plan to beat Russia and they won't take any notice of us. Mm. And because of that, we're gonna slip in the back door and we're gonna beat these guys. And when that happened, again, you know, use this word validation, there was validation of a plan. And the plan's ultimate, I guess, dream was to win the worlds. So once we beat Russia, we were on this pathway now, and then it was just game after game after game, and no real time to sit back and question what was happening. It was just, you know, we can do this. This is our game, Bob. I can now safely say 18.8 seconds ago, this is the Kiwis' first historic win in the World Championships. What a day. Absolutely, what a day. And the tall Russians look to be going for a fall in the first game up here. This is the game that we've targeted. This is the game that we wanted to win. Argentina, look out, and Venezuela, beware. New Zealand's going into the second round here. Time ticking away. We're down to seven it's seconds. It's all over, Bob. It's all over. Dickel doesn't even have to put up the shot. He hangs on to it, knocks it back outside. Phil Jones at the buzzer. The Jerry, he's going to He's got a three. Oh. New Zealand with a historic win, 90-81, can't believe it. All credit to Tab Baldwin and his team. The Kiwis come alive, 90-81, and Phil Jones nailed the three on the buzzer. You, you talk about sneaking through the back door, and I guess from a lot of teams' perspectives that was the case, but at what point, at what point in that championship did uh, it become apparent that you were going through the front door? When did they start to take notice of you? I think Puerto Rico did. Mm -hmm. Um, but see, what happened to Puerto Rico is, is they had also, and this is something we didn't appreciate in New Zealand, they had also been living their dream. And this was a very, very strong basketball country, but not a world champion, not a, you know, a semifinalist. And they had gone through their pool play, five wins and one loss, and finished the top seed with teams like the U.S. in their pool. Mm. So they were sort of on this wave as well. <clears throat> and when they came up against us, they probably felt like, okay, this team's for real, but they're not, you know, the world beaters that we have been because they've gotten beaten badly by Germany, Argentina, and the U.S., whereas we've gone five and one. So we probably still, you know, had that underdog advantage. This is our dream. The Tall Blacks are 
2.9 seconds away from a semi-final berth. Let's see what they do. The Puerto Ricans have to foul. Got it oh. to Piero Cameron. They have to foul. Big PC. They don't. It's all over, Bob. That's it's it. all over. We're in the top four. We go to the middle round. Give me five. Oh, the Kiwi crowd are going mental over there. They're all loco. This is one of the biggest moments in sporting history in New Zealand. The tall blacks are into the semi-finals of the World Championships against everybody's predictions. The Tall Blacks by two, 65-63. And I'm sure that all of New Zealand, all of the energy that's come from down under, emanating up here to Indianapolis has helped this team. Then in the semifinal against Yugoslavia, I'm sure they didn't take us for real until they're sitting in the halftime locker room down nine. And then I think they definitely took us for real because when they played in the second half, it was obvious that they took us for real. Nine point advantage then at half time in a, in a basketball game. Is that, is that something you should be able to protect at that level? No, no. A nine point lead is, is a strong performance and a half, but it's not by any stretch safe. Uh, not in the sport of basketball and not when you're playing against a team that was ultimately the world champion and, and going into the world championships was, you know, was one of the favorites. So Yugoslavia did what they had to do. They, they attacked us where they needed to attack us, and, and they took the game away from us. Paul Hinari into the game. Kirk Penny goes oh. straight to the hoop. Lovely little drive from him, slashes to the basket. This 11-point lead with 24 and a half seconds to go. Yugoslavia just have to control the ball for a couple of possessions, and it'll be all over, and they'll be going against Argentina tomorrow. Haven't the Kiwis played magnificently? They're just running out time now. There's nine seconds. Tad Baldwin and the Kiwi team, you can hold your head high. You've done us proud. You've done the country proud. You know, obviously what we've done in the past sort of speaks for itself. And now there's, a, there's an expectation to do well, not only from the public or media, but from within the, the tall black culture, from basketball New Zealand, from the players who are, who are involved. We have an expectation, you know, we've kind of set the bar, I guess, and, and now it's up to us and the future guys coming in to want to raise that bar and, and dream for gold. You're beaten by uh, the ultimate champions. You hopped on the plane and came home. How did you uh, perceive the reaction at home to what you'd achieved? You know, I was staggered by that experience of coming back to, you know, my adopted country, mm -hmm. not my home country, my adopted country. And... Um, you know, it's also humbling, and, and for me it was really humbling because I knew that, you know, a lot of the acknowledgments and, and um, benefits and rewards that I was getting were the product of a lot of men's work, hmm. you know, not just me. And um, I think when we had put so much emphasis on team as well, people were having a, a hard time saying, well, you know, who amongst this group of people do we you know, do we give the accolades to? Because uh -huh. you can't give the accolades to something called the Tall Blacks. And, and I think wrongly I was the beneficiary of a lot of it when I think I wish we could have just singled all the players out for all the things that they did for that team in 2002. One event where the national pride kicks in is the Olympics. Uh, and you got to uh, take the Tall Blacks to Athens. How special for you was the Olympics? Where does that place in, in your heart? That was a childhood dream, but not as a coach. But I always dreamed as a kid of participating in Olympics because it, it really is the, the ultimate competition, you know, where the nations of the world send their sporting best to compete against one another. And, and so the opportunity to go to Athens as well, you know, which is where it all started, uh, it, was, it was incredibly special. Judging from what you said about winning, 10th might have been a bit disappointing. It was. It was, it was one of the few times in my life, though, that, that um, even while it was going on, I knew that we were playing very, very good basketball, very good basketball, better than we had ever played as a tall black team. And we just couldn't get over the hurdle of winning games. And we were right there against great, great basketball teams. And, um, you know, a, a tenth placing doesn't, doesn't flatter our performances. Our performances were, were far superior to that. 
Um, but it is what it is, you know, and we can't walk away talking about how well we did in terms of results because it wasn't a great finish for us in terms of results. But I know as a basketball coach, and my players know, as a basketball team, we played our best basketball. On the way there, you, you took the team back to Jacksonville Beach to the stadium, your dad's stadium. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, how special was it? How emotional was it for you to, to sort of complete that circle? Very personal. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't ask anybody else to share in what I felt. You know, the players weren't there to fulfill any sort of, you know, 360 degree aspect of my life. Um, the players were there to, to build themselves up for Athens. But no question, you know, when the van pulled up into the parking lot of the gym that I played in and named after my dad, yeah, it was, it was uh, something that touched me very deeply. I wish my dad had been there, mm. you know, and been able to see it. You know, as you look through the glass doors into the lobby of the building, there's a plaque with, with my dad's face and figure on it and, uh, you know, just a, a dedication to him. And so that's, uh, you know, not everybody in life, mm. you know, comes from that sort of heritage. And, I, I'm, you know, hopefully we all love our parents and they've all been special in each of our lives. But to have it acknowledged in the way that it, it's been acknowledged back in my hometown and, and then to go back and be a part of it. It was special. Just a little glimpse every now and then when you walk past them? Yeah, you know, I mean, Dad, Dad died in 2001, and um, you know, it was a great loss in my life. Mm. Um, my mom died in 2001 as well, both of them tremendous losses in my life. But, you know, walking through the lobby and into the gym and having that plaque up there, there was a little bit of a feeling. And, and you know, Lord knows enough people said to me, I'm sure Dad will be looking down on you, you know, and be careful what you do in his gym. So enough people said that, that I certainly felt like his presence was there. And, uh, um, but, you know, it was, it was great and it was, uh, I think, special for, for all of us. We did go in there thinking we have a chance, we have a fighter's chance. And uh, if we got things right on the day and Argentina maybe was looking ahead a little bit, you know, we thought we could, we could get them. I think our performance reflected that we had a real determination to beat them that day. And in the end, they were just a better team than us. Argentina, do not give away anything. Nothing easy. Neither does New Zealand, and Argentina understands that. Inside. Oh, lovely pass Beautiful. by Pittle Pinnacle. Cameron. Inside to a cutting Paul Henare. And that was lovely. Look at that. What we've done in the past is only sort of fueled the fire within ourselves to do well and, and not just compete internationally, but to win. Uh, whenever we come together as a tall black team, and bottom line was we, we didn't give it our best shot for whatever reason. and, and at that level, um, the results speak for themselves once again. When, when you're not prepared and when you're not ready to give it your all, you, you lose um, at such a quality tournament. Well, it's turned out to be a sad and disappointing day for New Zealand basketball. As expected, the Tall Blacks were beaten by Argentina at the World Champs, but then came the surprise resignation of coach Tab Baldwin. An inconsistent tournament over. New Zealand outclassed despite having high hopes of success before tip-off. And while their loss may not have been too much of a surprise, an announcement after the game was. Yeah, I've told the team uh, after the game that, uh, that this was it for me. I've retired from uh, coaching the Tall Blacks. And a very difficult you know, decision to make, but one that I think is the best for the Tall Blacks, best for me, my family. Baldwin told the team straight after the game. They've just meant so much to my life and um, you know, my decision to talk to them after the game was a very personal decision and, and uh, it's going to remain that way. If I could remember the exact, his exact words, I think Tab said, uh, guys, it's, it's time for me to move on. And, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure all of us were sort of, you know, had our, our heads down and we're, we're listening, but 
you know, obviously still disappointed about the loss. And for me personally, I was, I was pretty shocked. Um, I mean, there'd been, been talk about when Tab would retire, but none of us were really sure of, of the timing or, you know, even if it was going to be after the World Championships, just not so soon. And, uh, and when he said it, it was, uh, it was, it was, you could almost feel the emotion in the room sort of lifting. Um, I know, you know, a few of us started looking up and looking him in the eye and he started talking about his time as a tall black and you could see how much it meant to him and how, how much of a, a tough decision it was for him to, to come up with this deci decision to, to move on and to other things in his life. And yeah, it was, uh, it was an emotional time for sure. You know, I hadn't just coached a lot of these guys for six years, I'd coached them through Auckland and yeah. through New Zealand juniors, and I had very strong relationships with them. And I think because of that, they understood why I made the decision. And and um, but it was difficult. Yeah. It was you know one of those times that I'm sure I'll look back on for many years and say, yeah, that was a hard moment in my life. Right thing to do, yeah, yeah. but difficult. I mean, after after all of it had, had happened, there wasn't a, a dry eye in the room. I can tell you that for a fact. But after Tab said what. You know what he needed to say and and how he needed to say it. Uh, I remember Paul Winitana sort of looked at me and sort of gave me a nod, and I knew what was coming. And and we gave him probably for me, it's, it was the most emotional, or powerfully emotional huckers that I've ever been involved with. Um, we just Paul started us off, and we all sort of just grouped around him, and everybody was focused on him, and we just gave it everything. We had. Um, I remember I was crying while I was doing the haka. I know a couple of other guys were um, when, when it was happening. And uh, I guess that just, we, uh, we paid our respects to, to a great man and a great coach. And I think that was uh, the best possible way that we could have done it to him at that time. And, uh, and after we had finished, we just all gave him a hug and, and that was it. I guess the important question now for you, Tab, is what now? What, what, what does the future hold for you? Well, hopefully, you know, a job in Europe, and I think I'll have to wait a few months, um, maybe around Christmas time when they start axing coaches over in Europe, opportunities will come up, and if my agents can, you know, pull a job for me, then, then that's where I want to go. And ultimately, I would like to get with the EuroLeague team, which mm. is, uh, you know, the top competition in Europe and um, see how I can do at that level. That's an extremely high level. If I can have some success there, then, then uh, that's my ambition right now. And beyond that, um, who knows? Might be a, an emotional question to, to sort of finish on now, but if Dad was alive and you could say to him, Dad, well, I've uh, finished this aspect of uh, what you didn't want me to do, which was coach. Uh, I feel quite happy. Uh, are you happy now? Would it be nice for your dad to be standing on this balcony and talk about that? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I don't think I've ever thought about it like that, but yeah, if, if uh, the genie popped up and said, I give you a wish and you know, you throwing that out there, the, the chance to stand here and talk basketball with my dad, in retrospect, looking at my career, I, you know, I wonder what he would say. Mm. And um, I hope he would be proud and um, I, I think, in many ways he would, but I, I know my dad and I'm sure he would stand here and tell me what I needed to do better as well. Tab, uh, I'm proud, I'm proud to have spent uh, this time with you. I, I know New Zealanders are uh, exceptionally proud to, uh, to an accept an American as one of their own now and uh, you have made New Zealand your home and I think uh, all that remains to be done is to thank you for your contribution to just not New Zealand basketball, to, to a golden era in New Zealand sport and, and thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Matthew, and New Zealand has certainly made me a better life and a better person. <laughs>